I wish to speak to you on this subject. Miracle days are here again. When you take the Holy Bible in your hands and you leaf through it and pause and give yourself enough time to read some of it, as you read the story of Jesus of Nazareth, the story of his disciples and apostles, the story of the Christians of the first century, the stories of the prophets and the old sages of God, you are immediately struck with one thing, the miracle working of God among human lives. Because on the front street of the Bible, miracles were always happening. Because people expected them to happen. They believed for them to happen. They had faith in God that miracles would happen. And God was stretching out his hand supernaturally, miraculously, everywhere. God was moving and speaking and setting people free on the right and on the left. Throughout the word of God, we read the stories of the great faith of men and women. Yea, even the faith of little boys and girls. And whenever anyone in the Bible had faith, when they were moved to have faith, when they acted by faith, God was moved into performing miracles. It was a fascinating time to be alive, for miracles were happening everywhere, any time of the day and night. And once again, miracle days are here again. I've preached this gospel in five continents. I've preached it in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, and now I'm preaching it in Australia. And I've seen the miracle working power of God wherever I have preached. I've seen the people give heed to the power uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've seen them hear the word, turn their faith loose. I've seen them saved from all kinds of sin. I've seen them healed from all manner of disease. And we're seeing in this campaign the wonderful works of God. If that's right, say amen. amen. Yes, neighbor, when you act by faith, God is moved into performing miracles. When Naaman acted by faith and dipped the seventh time, his leprosy was cured. When Moses acted by faith and stretched out his rod, the sea divided. When Joshua acted by faith and commanded, the sun stood still. When men acted by faith, God moved into performing miracles. What God did for people in the Holy Bible, he will do for you. If you act by faith, God will be moved. He'll be stirred. He'll move into action. He will set you free. He will heal you. He will make you a new creature from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. If you believe it, say amen. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey. Listen, today is one of those programs. This is going to be exciting. You're going to want to either record this or if you're watching on social media, go share it with everybody because you're going to have an unusual and insightful interview with Oral Roberts and our very own Pastor George Pearsons. This interview was from 1996, and Oral Roberts, really he really opens up about sharing his relationship and training with our founder, Kenneth Copeland. And over the years, we've been blessed to hear Brother Copeland, as you know, share those experiences time and time again where he was in services and crusades, and it's always powerful when he retells it. But you're going to hear it again from Oral Roberts himself, and you'll hear the perspective that he gives and the fresh take on it. You see, the core foundations that taught Brother Copeland by Oral Roberts can be found now right here on property at the KC Bible College. This interview touches on exactly that and how we can mentor someone. In 1966, Brother Copeland and Gloria attended a partner seminar of yours, and that's where the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go back to school. He was a 30-year-old student, or 30 year olds at the time, and the Lord said, I want you to go back to school. And he enrolled at Oral Roberts University in January of 1967. He has shared with us the story of becoming co-pilot, but the Lord was dealing with you at that time. 
about someone, a student that the Lord was going to send. Yes. What do you recollect about uh, that? Bob DeWeese was the uh, chairman of my crusade, my co-evangelist. And he was also our chief pilot of our company plane. And uh, he was uh, wanting to hire a co-pilot that was in harmony with our ministry. And I said, Bob, I've got a feeling there's somebody on this campus that will fit this bill. Why don't we just agree on, in the Lord that that person will show up? Mm. So uh, <laughs> it wasn't long after that till Bob said to uh, Oral, I think we found our man. There's a young man here from Fort Worth, Texas by the name of Kenneth Copeland. And he's a pilot and a commercial pilot. And uh, I've taken the privilege of, of um, testing him out in our plane. And I'd like for you to consider it. I said, Bob, if he suits you, it suits me because we all trusted our lives to God mm -hmm. and in his hands anyway. So if it suited Bob, our chief pilot, and so I got to meet Kenneth at that time. Well, the f first memory is his coming down the hall with his mother and my coming from the opposite. And uh, she had told my wife to be praying for her son. And Evan had told me that this young man was going to be there. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, that it was Ken. That's the first memory. But the first memory of the plane was not as a indelible because when I went to our company plane, I got on mm -hmm. and I really paid no attention because I had confidence in Bob DeWeese. And I looked up and saw the back of the head of this young man whom I had met, of course. And I just leaned back and had, had my mind on going to the crusade. And, and then I didn't uh, meet him until later during the crusade, and, and, and you may want to talk about that. Yes, during the crusade, he would help in the invalid room. Do you remember him in those situations? And Yes, and, uh, uh, Bob uh, assigned him to drive me, to, to pick me up at the hotel or the motel and drive me to the big tent mm -hmm. or to the auditorium. And uh, Ken laughs about it, he said, Bob said to him, now look, don't talk. Don't talk. <laughs> don't talk. We've all learned that too. <laughs> and uh, if he wants to say something to you, he answer him. Yes. But don't initiate anything because he's got his mind so focused on this service and delivering these people that he may not even hear what you're saying. And you may be offended because he's, he, he pays no attention to what you're, what you're saying. So don't talk. Well... Uh, I was just aware that this young man was driving me. But once we got there, and I'd preached a sermon, had the invitation to the unsaved, and got ready for the public healing line to come before me, I went out into the, the invalid tent, we, we, we called it, mm -hmm. that held about 200 invalids, where ambulances brought them, and there were not really, it, it really wasn't permissible f for them to be inside or advisable because many of them were so very ill. Well, Ken was assigned to the invalid room where he was telling them, in effect, re-preaching my sermon real quickly, mm -hmm. preparing them. He's going to lay his hand on you. He, he's going to say a word to you. He may not say a word to you. Uh, don't, don't, uh, prejudge what Oral Roberts is going to do right. because he's going to come in here with an anointing. And if he feels like touching you or if he feels like speaking to you, you be ready. Just be alert like, like this. And that was part of his job. He worked right beside you. Well, yes, there were... I remember one night uh, there was a... I believe it was a man... <clears throat> and he was so ill with cancer, and they had brought him in on this stretcher. And uh, Kenneth uh, had said, said something to the effect, how are you going to pray for this man? Mm. And I said, I'm not. So he, you know, looked shocked, and I said, you're going to pray for him. 
He said, I'm going to pay for it? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, what will I do? I said, pray for God to heal him. Mm. So he went in sort of tender-like, you know, it wasn't something he was accustomed to mm. doing. Yes. And he prayed a sort of a church prayer. <clears throat> and uh, so I was standing there and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord came on me. And as Kenneth, Kenneth himself relates this, I walked over and I just sort of elbowed Kenneth aside and I laid hands on this man and I said, in the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, come out of there and be healed. Well, that man jumped out of that stretcher. He began to leap to his feet and to throw up his hands and praise God. And Kenneth, first of all, said it scared him to death. <laughs> but then he learned. Well, that was a first experience, and you can imagine what it meant. And he was scared at first. It, of course really he was scared. It, it was not uh, the easiest experience in the world to face 200 invalids before you'd go out to pray for sick people, but they were ambulatory. They could walk and stand before you. Kenneth actually saw you using your faith like a mechanic uses a tool or a wrench, and he came up to you and said that to you. He uh, said, uh, Brother Roberts, I finally understand how to use my faith. Mm. He says, I noticed that you're using your faith as I would use a wrench. He said, you don't wait to get here to believe. You come in prepared. Your faith is already active. Mm. And you're, you've got your faith right here in effect in your hands. Of course, you don't have it in your hand, but in effect, that's, that's how he saw it. And it was like that he turned a wrench. When I touched a person, off my faith went to God. I released my faith to God. I expected God to heal. Which is more serious, your hands or some other part of your body? My hands and my eyes. Both hands? Yes. One hand is paralyzed, the other has no feeling. Right. And your eyes are very bad. Yes, sir, I can't. Back in the audience, you are a blur to me up here. Now, here's the way I wish to pray. You see, I believe Christ is standing beside me. I can't see him with my physical eyes. I see him through my mind. I feel him in my heart and standing by me. Uh, Ma'am? I feel him too. Yes, he told me in 1947 I was to lay hands upon the people in prayer and pray for them. He told me that. Now, as he stands by me and I see him not with my eyes but with my mind, as I see him, I see him saying, Oral, you lay hands upon Earlene Robbins as an instrument so I may heal her body. Now I'm touching you as he tells me. Are you ready? I'm ready. Christ, I touch her because you tell me to touch her, and I believe for her healing. Stretch forth your hands. Open and close them. Glory. <laughs> Let's help her rejoice. Shake my right hand. Yes, you have life. Shake this hand. Oh, you do have life. Uh, now, how does your... Look straight at me. Your eyes are clear. Yes, sir, you're as clear as a bell. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. You said I was a blur before, and now I'm clear. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you, God. You see, audience, I'm not always able to convey how I think and how I feel because words are so inadequate sometimes. But this is the way I do believe. I see Christ through my mind. It's as if he was standing here saying, Oral, you pray. You pray as I command you. And I can see him telling me that. And I believe it. Do you believe it? I do. Tell me exactly how you feel this moment. I don't know. I can't express it. It's just wonderful. Do you feel that way all over? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
And do you believe it's faith in God who did that? I know it. Now, I wasn't aware that I was using my faith like that until Kenneth pointed it out to me, and it evidently meant something to him. And he really, he had asked you to lay your hand on him. Yes. And as we talked about earlier, the, the impartation from one man of God to another, that was a critical moment in Brother Copeland's life because there was a transfer, a passing down of that anointing. Yes, that must have been uh, several crusades uh, after he began with us because his hunger deepened. Mm. It was evident that he was in love with Jesus' healing ministry. Did you begin to notice a development in him of that as the crusades went on that year? I noticed uh, how, how much better job he had begun to do in preparing the invalids for my coming. Uh, now just think for a moment of 200 invalids or mm -hmm. 150 invalids in, in an area, some on crutches, some on stretchers, some uh, in, in their mother's arms, uh, s some little demon-possessed children uh, tied to a post. Uh, it was really mm. a fearsome place if you thought about it from the natural. Well, I'd come to the point where that that was my life. Yes. I was more at home in an area like that was than I was at the, the, the dinner table, you know. Uh, but imagine a young man like Kenneth who had no background of this coming into that atmosphere to right. begin with right. and then being told to prepare them when all he could do was take something he'd heard me say during my sermon and try to put it into a few words and get those people, some of whom were so sick they could barely hear him anyway, mm. uh, somewhat ready to receive my prayers. And what I noticed was he, he, he got better and better and more articulate and had the people more expectant. And that didn't happen immediately. I mean, that happened yes. over a period of months as, as, as his very soul became involved. And I didn't really know, though, how deeply... This was getting inside Kenneth. I knew he was doing his job, and I knew he loved it, and I knew he was weeping, and, and he'd be rejoicing when there would be a, an evident healing. But he had another advantage. He had Gloria, his wife, who was back home there in Tulsa with the children, and she was studying the Word uh, just about as many hours as, as he was studying mm -hmm. in the university. And sh she was deepening herself in understanding the healing ministry. And then he would come home and share with Gloria what had happened. She would share from the Word what she had read. Yes. And so Gloria's input into his life from the Word and then the Crusades input into his life through the actual happening combined with his own hunger and desire. And looking back, mm -hmm. I can see it much better than I could then, how it all happened. And I certainly don't want to take any undue credit for his development or ministry because I know it was the Lord dealing with him and in his own determination. Once he saw the reality of it, it must have awakened the inner man yes. of yes. Ken. He shares one time, he was driving you to a, uh, a crusade one evening and you would not talk, you would not speak, but this one particular time you spoke to him and you told him three things. He, you said to him, find out what the will of God is confer no longer with flesh and blood, and get the job done. I, I, I know he wanted to ask, but I know he was too courteous because they'd ask him not to. Mm -hmm. So I, I told him to find out what the will of God was for his life. Mm. 
That's number one. Number what one. does God want me to do? I was saying, Ken, no matter how much you're with me or anyone else that, that knows the Lord and who's praying for the sick and winning souls, don't confer with them too much. Uh, you've got to confer with God, the mm. source of it all. You learn from these people, but, but you're going to get it straight from God. I knew the cost would be big. I knew he had no idea the cost. Mm. I knew that the people that I ministered to, 10,000, 15,000 a night, had no conception of what we went through of the persecution that we endured, the misunderstanding of, of many of the, of the ministers who didn't want us in the city, some who tried to, to uh, stop the crusades in the early days of the ministry, and uh, how the media at that time, uh, well, to be frank about it, they were not very kind, mm. and the misrepresentations and, and and all of that that you had to face, uh, plus your own inadequacies, your own mistakes, those were very serious to, to, to a person mm. facing human beings who are desperately hurting, either as sinners or as sick people or, or Christians who are sick people. And they've come there wanting your prayers and more or less leaning on you more than they're looking to their own faith. And I knew there was an enormous cost of, of being alone, of spending time with God, of not letting people get to you, and not even letting your family mm. take too much of your time. And that would cost your wife a lot. It certainly cost my wife and children a lot because I was gone three-fourths of the time mm -hmm. She had to raise the children. Uh, I look back at the enormous cost and I wonder if I had known it in advance if I would have been willing to pay it. I was really trying to communicate to him mm -hmm. that if you really are called to this work, you be sure you're called because it's going to cost you your life. He said that when he came to school in January, he had planned to stay for many years. Yes, he, he had. Yet towards the end of that school year, the Lord began to talk to him. Do you recollect any, the time that he had, he had said, I'm going to be leaving school, do you remember any of that and launching out into his own ministry? Do you recollect any of that when he left? Well, that's when Gloria entered the picture more. Uh, I, I remember that they got hold of some tapes by Brother Kenneth Hagin. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the Hagen's ministry really penetrated their spirit. The uh, word of faith uh, phrase that he uses a lot was probably inspired by the tapes that he heard mm. of um, Brother Hagen. And uh, I saw that Kenneth was receiving a better education than most of my students were. Why? Because he not only was studying in the university, taking a normal load of classes, but he was with the founder of the school. He was with me where the action was. Yes. And not only the preaching and the healing, but he was there when I was talking. When, when, I, when Bob DeWeese and I were planning, and he was in on everything. He was getting what most of the students never had the opportunity to get. Mm -hmm. So Kenneth's education, though it was briefer than the, the others for the most part, was in, in some ways much more rounded mm -hmm. as has been evidenced through these years. Wow, isn't it great to see Or Robert sharing how he helped Brother Copeland? You know, what he taught Brother Copeland in those days, we find now, today, at Kenneth Copeland's Bible College, right here on the property of KCM and the Victory Channels. Students come here from all over the world to learn and then intern with us. 
all that word just builds up and, and builds up and pretty soon you've got to do something with it. And that's what we give students here on the property of KCM. They're actually able to volunteer. They volunteer at the church. They volunteer at the ministry. They volunteer with the Victory Channel. In fact, you may have actually seen some volunteering here to do recreations for Revival Radio TV. We do that so that you can have actual experience in ministry. You know, Brother Copeland brought his interest and his pilot skills to help Brother Roberts. So today, students do the same thing right here with KCBC. Love just kept expanding in what Brother Copeland knew, and they began putting him to work more and more there at ORU. Eventually, he knew how to do what Brother Roberts did. Imagine what it would feel like if your student had experienced this. Earl Roberts was very happy to see his protege succeeding as the years went by. In those prayer tents, for instance, Brother Roberts prayed for the sick, but there were so many that would show up. Brother Copeland began praying for the people to be healed and delivered too, but he was trained by Brother Roberts first. Now, this interview was shot over 20 years ago. Kenneth Copeland Ministry has seen over 50 wonderful years of people accepting Christ, experiencing miracle and deliverances. And it just keeps happening. Brother Jerry Savelle was next, mentored by Brother Copeland. And back then, all they had was the tape ministry. Today, our students are often behind the cameras. And you'll see some of the students here acting, like I said before, sharing updates of the miracles God's doing in their lives. The fact is, being mentored is a very important part of any relationship. Watching this interview, I know you could see the anointing that was on Brother Roberts, but also the intimacy that they shared. They had a real lifelong connection. It seemed to expand what Brother Copeland could do because of that relationship. You and I, we all have talents that God gives us, and God likes to expand what we know to do. So as we go today, I want to encourage you to target your faith, how to expand your borders this week. What is it that God wants you to do? Who's nearby that needs to hear that Jesus loves them? It really is that simple. We make it so difficult. Who needs the prayer of faith over their circumstances? You know, just being able to pray with someone opens the door many times for a deeper relationship. When we have true compassion in a relationship with Jesus and we want to share that, that opens the door to so much more. Well, I know you enjoyed this today. Share this interview with anyone you know on social media Share the website, Revival Radio TV. And thank you for being a part of the Victory Channel and what we do here. And if you got someone interested in KCBC and attended college here, just go to kcbiblecollege.com and be a part of what God's doing right here on the campus of KCM. We'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV. 